Obstetrics and Gynecology, Professor Alfred Irose Enkeba. Today, he will do justice to the topic the pains and gains of championing and pioneering a new surgical paradigm, the caesarean mimectomy story. May I now invite the registrar, Mr. Adebola Bobola, MNI, FCIPM, to introduce the vice chancellor and the vice chancellor's procession, the registrar.
Okay, the way the Dean of Faculty of Environmental Sciences in a matter is uh, unavoidably assist is represented by Dr. V. N. Okori. <laughs> of course, the inaugural lecture about three, two or three weeks ago, the Dean Faculty of Law, Professor V. O. Adokai. Professor E. O. Ayomui is representing the Dean Faculty of Physical Sciences. <laughs> Dr. I. M. Akedo is also standing in for Dean Faculty of Social Sciences. <laughs> the Director of our Distance Learning Program, Professor C. O. Emokara. Professor H. Oyen Penan is the Director of the Center for Educational Technology. And of course, the, the tallest in the, in the park, uh, talking about the Director of the Telephone Center of Excellence, Professor O.J. Abolaka. The wall is blocking him, but uh, don't worry, it's a very much there. Please let's give him a round of applause again. He's driving the Center of Excellence uh, powered by World Bank. Professor Mrs. Dikorea is the Director of Central Research Collaboration of the US. <laughs> Professor E. Eragui is the Director of the University's Advancement Office. <laughs> Dr. D. Mwandere is the Acting Director of the Institute of Child Health. Then, Dr. Mrs. I. F. Yang is the Acting Director of the Institute of Education. <laughs> Dr. E. O. Ogato is the Acting Director of the Institute of Public Administration at IAEAS. <laughs> of course, we have here the Acting Director of Student Guidance and Counseling. Dr. Mrs. O. M. I. P. A. And uh, Mr. Monte Owe, the Deputy Registrar, said it matters let the delegation of the proceedings. The civil ladies and gentlemen, as is the practice and in line with the tradition of the university, it is my singular honor to call on the acting vice chancellor. The Deputy Vice Chancellor Administration, who is standing before the VC, to present the inaugural lecture. Uh, she really welcomes you all and uh, she's uh, 
It's really a pleasure for her to be here, for her to welcome you here. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to the 266th in the inaugural lecture series of the University of Benin. Today's lecture is the 38th to be delivered in my tenure as the Vice Chancellor of this university. Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. I'm happy to inform you that the second semester examinations for full-term students have commenced in various faculties, schools and institutions. I want to thank all stakeholders for their cooperation in this regard. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce our lecturer for today. Alfred The title of this lecture is The Pains and Gates of Championing a New Surgical Paradigm, the Caesarean Malmectomy Story. Professor Alfred E. was born on the 27th of November 1952 in Benin City. To the family of Mr. Osewa of Higiepa and Mrs. Omoye Kemele Higiepa, both of blessed memory from Ikoba, upper local government area of the state. He attended Ulebu Primary School in Ikoba, upper local government area of the state, where he obtained his first school living certificate in 1964. He had his Secondary education at the Immaculate Conception College in the city, where he obtained his West African School Certificate in 1969. He was one of the 108 students admitted to the then Midwest Institute of Technology in 1970. This institution was later upgraded and renamed University of Benin. He was also one of the 20 students selected to read medicine, medicine and sent to Amadou Bedo University Zaria for his preclinical training. He returned to the University of Benin to continue his academic program and graduated with bachelor's, of, bachelor's degree in medicine and surgery in 1976. He therefore became one of the first medical doctors of Ojus by this university. He did his mandatory national youth service at the Medical Health Center of Tolo, in the way in Anambra State. He therefore thereafter proceeded to England to complete his residency training and sat for the final examination of the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecology in 1982. He obtained his West African College of College Fellowship in Obstetrics and Gynecology and the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecology in April and June 1983, respectively. He then joined the services of the University of Benin as a lecturer one in 1986 and rose through the ranks to the position of full professor of obstetrics and gynecology in 2011. His primary research focus is in the area of obstetrics and gynecology. Professor Nikierba has held several administrative positions within and outside the University of Benin, such as Head, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, University of Benin and University of Benin Teaching Hospital. Between 2001 and 2002, he was the examination officer, faculty of medicine, College of Medical Sciences, University of Benin. He has been a member of the University Ceremonial Ceremonial Committee from 2009 until date. He is the national president, University of Benin and Alumni Association. He was between 1981 and 1983. That was why you could hear the shout of great to the great at the very beginning, because he's been the president of the national uh, of 
the University of Guinea and Alumni Association, and he's been very active in it. He's a life executive member, Nigerian Red Cross Society, Edo State Chapter, from 1982 until date. Chairman, Enhanced Clinical Services Committee, UBTH, 1995 till 1997. Deputy Chairman, Medical Advisory Committee, UBTH, 1999 to 2003. Acting Chief Medical Director, UBTH, 2003 to 2004. Project Director, Family Planning Unit, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, UBTH, 2008 till date. He's been the resource person for the development of a dual language and literature curriculum for the post basic education in the new state, 2006. Professor Enigeba has over 40 publications in local, national, and international journals and has attended and presented in several conferences within and outside Nigeria. You know, he was called a teacher of teachers. He has supervised over 35 postgraduate dissertations. That means he has produced over 35, but you can imagine the number of uh, doctors, professors that he has produced over in his training. He's a recipient of several awards, including the prestigious one of Univent U during the celebration of the Golden Jubilee of University in 2021. Professor Enigewa belongs to several professional bodies and associations, such as the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecology of England, the West African College of Surgeons, is a fellow of the West African College of Surgeons, the Society of Obstetrics and Gynecology, the Edo Club Benin, the Professionals Club Benin, Immaculate Conception College, Old Boys Association, The University of Benin Alumni Association is the past president worldwide. In 2005, Professor Yigeba was honored as a Benin Achiever by the Oba of Benin, Oba Elisa. Professor Yigeba has passion for reading. He is married to Mrs. Osarebe Yigeba. And their marriage is blessed with children and grandchildren. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to invite Professor Alfred Irmose Yeba, the Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome all of you. I want to ask your
Uh, yes, gentlemen, I must say, I want to crave your indulgence to allow me to stand in the existing group. Um, this is the 266th inaugural lecture of the University of Benin. The title is The Fails and the Gains championing a new surgical paradigm, the Caesarean Myomentum story. Um, I'm going to have this outline starting with the beginning and ending with acknowledgments. The beginning, the very beginning of this story. Well, this is a photograph of the University of the Resumption, taken by the Sunday Observer of November 22nd, 2000, not 2000, 1970. <laughs> uh, you see, the, the, the Observer captioned it, MIT is all set to go. You find out on the left hand side. And there were three students arriving in the campus, and the student on the extreme left and right hand corner was me. We <laughs> were uh, arriving in the campus on Sunday for the official opening of the University of Munich on Monday, January, November 2010, 1970. That's to me, is the beginning of my relationship with the University of the Day. And it's been in existence now. Uh, by way of introduction, the Cecilia Mahometrophy story is an opportunity for me to share my experience in research, innovation, and teaching activities as a medical doctor and university lecturer and teacher. It is a story that covers over 40 years of my working life. The pains and games talk about arose from my attempt to challenge an old surgical order and I contributed to making my life successful. Thanks for our research. For your life to be successful, you will be filled with heroes and pains. The Caesarean section is an operation that we use to deliver a baby through an incision on the abdomen and the uterus of the mother. It may be a plan or an emergency procedure. Uterine fibers, on the other hand, are non cancerous growths or swellings of the uterus. They can be very numerous and can attain very large sizes and may become life threatening through the development of some complications. They are usually treated by surgical operations, a procedure known as myomentum. These two surgically indicated indications for a myomentum and a cesarean section will be present in the same individual. Over the years, obstetric surgeons have been trained never to do these two operations together with the same woman at the same time. Because the bleeding associated with such a combined operation will be fatal. In my third year as a lecturer one consultant of statistician and gynecology in 1989, UBTH, I had to do these two operations together and in the same patient. We published what we did. That event has changed the world surgical paradigm, affected my work, it is the subject, my work life it is the subject of this lecture. The phenomenon of change 
The medical world is filled with discoveries, innovations, which were initially violently resisted before being embraced after many evidence of this past. Louis Pasteur taught that disease was spread by germs. He made the discovery after three of his five children died from infectious diseases. When he first put forward his theory in the 1850, he was met with violent resistance from the medical community. Today, in large part due to his work, we know that certain bacteria are responsible for sickness and that minimizing or eradicating germs is key to promoting healthy immune function. As university teachers and lecturers, it is a basic fact that what we were taught as students is not exactly what we teach our students today. Change as a concept moves the world. The road for the evolution of scientific progress has not been a smooth one. George Bernard Shaw famously said, all great truths begin as blasphemous. Less well known is that intolerance has often come more from within the ranks of the scientific community itself than from without. As Arthur Stoppen has recognized, an important idea of a truth must endure a most reception before it is accepted. He said, first, the idea is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. Third, and finally, it is accepted as being self-evident. The surgical removal of uterine fibroids at the time of cesarean section was not only a case of teaching, it was considered unsafe. Moreover, it was audacious for a young person like me at that time in the profession to attempt to change the status quo. Did I receive advice or something like this? You best right. The beginning, inevitable cesarean moment to be 1989. A 36-year-old patient, an undergraduate and a known hypertensive, had a tried fibroid the size of 32 weeks pregnancy. She was caring for malmetomy as she became pregnant before the surgery. At 38, 28 weeks of her into her pregnancy, her hypertension worsened and she was admitted for conservative management. At 32 weeks, she went into spontaneous preterm labor. The fibroids were big and causing obstruction to the normal delivery of the baby. A cesarean section became necessary. In theater, we found that we could not get to the baby because it was surrounded by big fibroids. Necessitating the removal of the anterior huge fiber before we could extract the baby. So I looked up the theater and had the other doctor the theater since I removed this big fiber. Why should I need to remove the baby? Because I'm not supposed to leave this for behind. There was no answer. So I went on to remove the remaining four fibers. Bleeding was significantly minimized with oxytocin infusion. The blood loss was 1.5 liters. And I must say that the blood loss of 1.5 liters was lost when I was removing the first fiber before I delivered the baby. She was transfused with two units. The baby went to from one kg, and the baby did well. The fibers together weighed more than five times the weight of the baby. The use of high dose of oxytocin after the delivery of the baby, and for 12 to 24 hours thereafter, minimized the risk of severe bleeding. And this is a photograph, ladies and gentlemen, of a lady with a very severe malmetomy on the left hand side. You can see the abdomen with two bodies, one in front, that's where the fibroid stayed, while down below, below the umbra that was, was where the baby was forced to stay. And we did the cesarean myometomy. Uh, this, that
that was nail delivering the baby. We always deliver the baby first. And then we close the uterus to get the the, the hole through which we deliver the baby closed and we deliver the uterus and the fibers. So what you see on the left hand side is the fiber still attached to the uterus. And then we went on to remove the fiber. And on the right hand side is the fiber, not fiber, the fiber, but the other smaller fibers in which you can see. That is the same one. The blood was in this order. It was very good. But well, we were taught when we were students and we were growing up that you never should attempt to do this. was reported as inevitable cesarean malfunction. We said inevitable, but there was nothing we could do. We had to deliver the baby, so we had to remove the fiber. That report shocked the obstetric world. It was the first reported case of these two operations being done together in the same day. I thought they were not a failure of it, but it's also going to fail later in life. The reaction of my senior colleagues. During the International Conference of the Society of Obstetrics and Gynecology of Nigeria in Benin, soon after the publication, my teachers and my senior colleagues told me to sweat the surgery I did. And they said, That's what we want to talk to. The editor of the Tropical Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Professor Otu, opined that. Should not be crucified. Rather, others dead in the profession should see if they can replicate what I have done. I was certainly very worried by his words. The breakthrough uh, booster, the Dr. Jobo here, he told me he was going to be here. But Dr. Jobo, oh, that's him, please stand up there and see Dr. Ojobo, 
Dr. Ande, now Professor Ande, who was my senior registrar then, and myself made this publication. And that publication caused some commotion in Dr. J. It was the largest world series then. It was the first series of obstetric surgeons deliberately removing fibers from the uterus in women undergoing cesarean section. It came from the developing world. That's what shocked everybody. In fact, one research competitor, I'm quoting him, he shuddered at the series and he said, Come from that part of the world. I must say that that paper was the biggest moral boosting publication that we had on the subject for the following reasons. I was shocked at the speed with which the paper was accepted. Received March 7th, revised June 6th, and as soon as they received the reverse copy, they, they, they approved the publication. And that paper has turned out to be one of the most referenced papers on the topic by more than 176 authors worldwide. Almost every research author on the subject references. You cannot make the publication of Caesarean Malmetrum without referring to that paper. Except now. There are so many publications. But in the early days, that was the publication that we saw as a reference. Now we went and got into another Wahala. In this Caesarean section, I only saw the Malmetrum in a woman who was not having Caesarean section. I was pregnant. There was this pregnant medical doctor. She was a medical doctor. She had a different fibroid and she had an umbilical hernia. And the fibroid, as the uterus was growing, was carried into the hernia sac. And then the came, um, the surgeon said, incarcerated. He came incarcerated and the woman was having very severe pain. The surgeons and we, the obstetric team, we are scrambled to theater. Because the fiber had a long stop, we, Dr. Sado, Jeme, and myself, decided to remove it carefully without disturbing the pregnancy. This was a pain against the teacher. But our experience with the CCM and Mentally Series is flawless. The blood loss was very minimal. She went on after five days, and at 39 weeks of gestation, she had a normal delivery of a 3.5. the literature and the nearest we found were two cases. One by Shira et al. who talked about the dominator implant by breast gestation and incarcerated in women and women in pregnancy. And the second was British et al. who talked about important cases of incarceration of the graphic uterus due to an impacted name by woman. This year two cases. None of these two reported in my momentum in pregnancy. Ours was the first. <laughs> we published this report in Geba and Selo for German in 1989. My momentum in pregnancy in passivated fibroid in the hernia sac. Now we went into the period of consolidation. This was a period of confidence theory and monitoring the world's reaction to the surgical innovation. Many authors, especially in Latin America, West Africa, Middle East, all started reporting their experience with civilian women. I became a manuscript review editor on the subject to many journals. Journalists who sent articles of Caesarean Malmetomy to me, asking me to be published. And because I needed to support the message that Malmetomy during Caesarean session is not as dangerous as one believed, it means all the papers that were sent to me were recommended for publication in all the Many authors were usually 
they will tell you the only thing that is constant in this world is change. That was a phrase I used in my first publication. Some cardinal lessons we learned during the consolidation period. The first is that case selection was important or is important, especially if you are new in the discipline. Whereas I can successfully manage any case, younger obstetric surgeons must avoid potentially difficult cases, especially fibroids at the back of the uterus. The closure of the fibroid cavity in the uterus must be done meticulously. The suture cavity must be well selected and the sutures must be placed closely and the number of layers must be added. This is to make sure that we control bleeding from the very beginning. The tension attached to the sutures must be very minimal, just enough to stop myometria or oozing from the uterine muscle uh, wall. An oxytocin of 30 international units, going at the rate of 20 to 30 drops per minute, must be in place for 12 to 24 hours. This is very critical, otherwise the uterus can relax and bleeding from the uterus will result with many unpleasant consequences. And if you are doing a cesarean mammogram, cross match blood. You may not use it, but cross match blood. Introducing cesarean mammogram to share a hospital. I was appointed local consultant to share hospital in 1986, two years after I got because I was a member and I fell of the Royal College of Institutions and the Colleges of Great Britain. And Shell Hospital was looking for such British trained obstetrician and gynecologists to manage their patient. So they came to me, they came to UBTH, and recruited him as a local to Shell. In 1993, I was performing a cesarean session at the Shell IA Hospital in Port We found that the patient had a B anterior fibroid. After closing the uterus, I argued with the anesthetist. If I could take that, can I take out this fibroid? He was alarmed. And he was very emphatic, which is no, don't. If I did, he was saying no, don't. He said no, don't, Alfred. You know, we are colleagues. Uh, my assistant surgeon was a senior female nurse. I asked her opinion. She was even more emphatic in her, yes, take it out. I didn't ask for the scalpel. I denied the use of it. And I asked the anesthetist to watch and estimate the blood loss of 30 units of oxytocin running. The blood loss was very minimal. That is what how the anesthetist described it. And he wondered out loud why obstetric surgeon was scared of removing fibroids during cesarean surgery. Thereafter, I did many cesarean monumental as a share of hospital with confidence and support from the medical nursing and women's staff. That was the thing that they all used, they all used to hail and praise me anytime I am in Port Harcourt doing the work. The beginning of acceptance. In a letter to the editor of the African Journal of Reporting there in 2004, we heard the Jumbo and they and myself, we heard one of the first important stories from Ghana after us. The doctor, Dr. Kwao Kuben, advocated the use of a tourniquet after the delivery of the babies to minimize blood loss during the subsequent malaria. We were using oxytocin. He noted that uterine fibers were common amongst black women. And that encountering them as a cesarean session is inevitable in my practice. We were excited that another researcher from Africa has emphasized the positive findings of the series of our country as a cesarean session. Meanwhile, another research, researcher, Ben Pater, at the Third World Congress on Controversies in Obstetrics, Gynecology, and infertility in Washington, D.C. in 2002. 
brought up Caesarean myometomy or myometomy during Caesarean session and asked the question, is it time to consider? It was obvious, Madam Vice Chancellor, that the flame of Caesarean myometomy necessity had not only been ignited, it was being found. Continuing with what we thought was the right way to go on this subject, removing fibrous found in caesarean section and taking all necessary steps to reduce the complication. Then we went into another area, repeat caesarean myometry in the same patient. The Vice Chancellor in 2004, and then Eligeba and Meola reported a case of repeat myometomy and caesarean section in the same patient. The woman had a classical caesarean section. That's a caesarean section you do on the top of the uterus. We usually like to do caesarean section on the lower end of the uterus. Because the lower end is, is safer, it's easier. But the surgeon who did this woman's caesarean section had to use the top because the lower end was filled with fibers. And in, that was in 1992. Then in 1994, we had to do a repeat caesarean section on this one. And we found that we could take out the fibroid in the lower segment that we were running from. So we removed the fiber and delivered the baby. The woman was fine. The fiber was so huge. It was 14 centimeters by 12 centimeters. Seven years after we did that operation, that woman became pregnant again. And then there's another cesarean section. When we opened her up, we found that she developed another fiber that was six centimeters by five centimeters in the same lower segment of the uterus. And we proceeded and removed it again. We noted that this probably was again the first of such cases ever reported. <laughs> this case illustrated the high incidence and rapidity with which uterine fibroids can emerge or grow among Africans. I self-assize in women's health in 2013 under the title The Burden of Uterine Fibers for African American Women, results of the National Center. Now, Vice Chancellor, this is the area of this lecture that I am going to find very difficult to present. 2010, we had our only mortality. And this mortality was the most severe pain we had. It is our one and only mortality. We haven't had any other mortality either before or after 2010. This lady was a young, pleasant lady having her first baby. I was found to have many fibroids in both the anterior and posterior uterine wall, which will obviously affect labor and prevent normal delivery. An electric caesarean myometomy was planned. The surgery done by me was on a bed. It lasted only 40 minutes, and the total blood loss was 400 minutes. It was not even immediately considered necessary to transfuse her. As usual, high dose of oxytocin infusion was put up to run for 24 hours. She was observed in the ward postoperatively for two hours. Certified OP and was transferred to the maternity ward. Two hours in the ward, disaster struck. The oxytocin infusion got finished and the staff in the ward changed the infusion but failed to add high dose of oxytocin. This was written down. And this girl. Had you tried it too? 
and she had massive blood loss. The event, the massive blood loss, was not even recognized by the staff until she had cardiac arrest on her bed. We took her back to the theater, opened her up. She had a massive transfusion of 22 units of blood. My students lined up to donate blood to this lady. But in spite of all that, she died. She was my very good friend who had absolute confidence in the system and in me. It was my most devastating e encounter. I doubt, Madam Vice Fellow, if I truly recovered from her loss. Our experience with maternal mortality, Madam Vice Chancellor, every day, the world over, 810 women die from preventable causes relating to pregnancy and childhood. The lifetime risk of maternal death in low-income countries like Nigeria, as a whole, is about one death in 45 deliveries. So by the time you have 45 women delivery, you're going to have one dying. Whereas in the developed parts of the world, the number of dead is so low, it's about one death in 5,400 deliveries in the high-income countries. A systematic review and meta-analysis conducted in 2018 and published in the Lancet showed that a quarter, 25 percent, of all these women who died while giving birth in low and middle east, middle income countries had undergone cesarean section. In other words, cesarean section is a very, uh, a very important cause of death is in uh, in these ladies. An obstetrician practicing in one of the low income countries of the world, I have had my own fair share of experiencing maternal death. I have witnessed women dying after normal delivery. And I have witnessed women dying after all complicated cesarean section. And many of these things they are avoided. There is, however, no research to date comparing death from caesarean section and death from caesarean malnutrition. My question is, I have done hundreds of caesarean malnutrition. I have had only one mortality. <laughs> Somebody asked me, what is the way you do with caesarean malnutrition? If I ask them to come to this with a serious one, the management of UBTH set up a fact-finding inquiry after this girl died, and the committee that was asked to look into the matter submitted this report, which concluded that I did not mismanage the patient. That's not the report. The hospital management was expected, so the management rejected that, and the committee was asked to have a second look at the matter. The committee came to the same conclusion again. The board of management of the hospital still dissatisfied, then set up a board management committee before which I appeared. The committee made the following recommendation and management implemented them. That one, I was suspended without pay for three months and two, the operation of my medium cesarean session was banned, henceforth, in UBT. Attempted resignation from UBTH. My reaction to my suspension was devastating. I lost the patient from poor management for which I accepted responsibility. The patient was my friend, which made him lost even more devastating. I decided I resigned from UPT, which was the answer to my unacceptable situation. I wrote my resignation letter. However, friends and colleagues here yeah, have known that Mrs. Yinga Ade, who was my patient, who was very close to my family, and who came to my heart to beg my wife and I that I must not resign. This friend told me that 
the fact that those who first voiced scientific revolutions were always initially persecuted, wanted, and I usually took a long time for them to be understood or appreciated. The anger in me, caused by this girl's death and my suspension, was so devastating to my head that I developed type 2 diabetes. I'm lucky that I'm a medical doctor, so the resulting complications were minimal because of any recognition and prompt intervention. I did not know on the first how the news of my suspension got to Port Harcourt, but I got a call from Shell Hospital requesting to know the length of my suspension and wondering if I would like to spend the period working for them. Of course, I jumped at the offer. I relocated to Port Harcourt and spent three months working for Shell. I don't need to tell you, in terms of uh, the financial reward, I was wrong not to go into that. It was during this time that my sabbatical period with Shell was discussed and agreed upon. The response of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology to the ban of Cecilia Mahmoud by UPT. It was after I resumed work following my suspension that my department met to discuss the ban on the procedure by UPTH management. I remember that meeting. I just sat, I didn't utter the word. But my colleagues decided and notified the UPTH management that one, the procedure of Israel Mahometomy has become an internationally recognized and practiced procedure. Therefore, UPTH, as an internationally recognized hospital, must continue to practice and teach it to junior doctors and management will not ban it. In fact, my department asked UPTH to reverse itself on this matter. We didn't hear anything from money. But I can tell all of you here present that that procedure is now routine in UBT. <laughs> Further negative attitude on my part at resumption, called it the self affliction of pain. Okay. Resuming back at UBT was not easy for me. Usually, all my residents and students would know. But I resume work at 7 o'clock in the morning. I do a teaching round for my students and residents for one hour before I join the department. I have a clinical meeting at 8 30. That has been my work routine since I became a lecturer. The anger generated in me made it difficult for me to continue being who I was before the episode. It took a lot of counseling from my friends who insisted that I was only continually hurting myself by refusing to be my usual self in my work attitude. I wished I had read President Nelson Mandela's self counsel that as he was leaving the prison where he spent 28 years incarcerated on justice, he was leaving behind his anger. He said if he didn't do that, he would still be in prison. I didn't, uh, my anger imprisoned me and did a lot of harm to me. My sabbatical period on other Caesarean Mahometomy studies. I went to Shell for my sabbatical from November 2010 to October 2011. And that was an opportunity for further healing and planning more surgeries on this vexed procedure. One month into my sabbatical, I have built enough capacity for one medical officer to handle easy cases. By the tenth month, five medical officers had acquired enough training and exposure to enable them to operate. Chef simply told me these doctors, fresh from M1S, train them how to do CCL sections. It was a community hospital. You know, we have called the local government area. And what I 
was then doing is uh, aggressively going into my caesarean myometomy studies. Because during my sabbatical, I designed prospective studies on caesarean myometomy to justify why it is necessary. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this picture is a typical picture we have. On the left hand side is the baby. You can see the baby very well. The on the wing scale. The scale is breathing 2.2 kilograms. On the right hand side is a fiber removed remove from the same initials. And the scale is breathing 7.3 kilograms. These two structures, the baby and the fiber, were taken out from the same initials during cesarean myometry. In 12 months of my sabbatical, my doctors and I did 446 Sicilian sections. And I did 42 Sicilian mammogram with no mortality. The first is on how unsafe is Caesarean myometomy, um, published by the Tropical Journal of Homes and Gynae, by myself and three or four other doctors. And the second was Caesarean myometomy outcome in the Nigerian District Hospital, published by the Journal of Basic and Clinical Reproductive Science. These two studies turned out to be the first prospective studies on the subject. We noted the number of location sizes of fibrous removal as well as the intraoperative blood loss, the intra and postoperative complications, and the need for blood transfusion and the length of hospital stay. I must say that a lot of women from Abia and even states came to my hospital demanding caesarean myometomy because they wanted their fibroids removed at the time of caesarean surgery. At least two of them we recorded and we obliged them. What do you do or how do patients who have uterine fibroids who are having caesarean sections without myometomy, how do they fare? Some authors have reported that the blood loss in patients who have caesarean sections with uterine fibroid and the fibroids not removed was much higher than our average loss. They explained that because the fibroids were not removed, they interfered with the uterine ability of the uterine to contract and that was more significant problems. In fact, personal communication, many consultants have told me that they've done caesarean section without removing fibroids. The patient started bleeding. They took the patient back to, back to tear. To do, to either remove the fibroid or remove the uterus to save the woman's life. Our learning academic publications on caesarean my mentor. Well, uh, Mr. Vice Chancellor, what we have done here is we have listed out all the early publications about Caesarean Mountain appearing in journals in the world. The first three, like you can see, were done by our team. The first one by Dr. Wawa and I. The second, which is the myometomy in pregnancy by Dr. Sergio Jeremy and I. And the third one, which is the, the bumper uh, publication by Ojobo and I. Uh, there are many publications. I just listed them here. And all of them came to the 
Same conclusion. But I'm going to be during the Caesarean section. It's not as dangerous as one story. Two decades after our golden contribution on this subject, the traditions of Baham and the men accepted that my momentum in this session is a reasonable surgical procedure. Hundreds of thousands of academic publications, if you Google Caesarean my momentum, you will see at least 230,000 publications in 0.34 seconds. All over the world, but they all, I mean, they were all for, they all followed our three publications. It was our three publications that made a lot of people to venture into removing fibroids during the Caesarean section. All these authors and researchers emphasize one thing that the procedure is not as dangerous as one thought. Different authors have provided different, different um, evidence that our multimedia is the section is safe. Conclusion, the road to this great change has not been smooth. The facilitators for this change were surprisingly the editors of the International Journal of Obstetrics and Technology in Chicago, who accepted to publish a groundbreaking article in June 2001. All of the articles of this subject was dated to that publication. That publication brought awareness to the obstetric world that the procedure is safe. It opened the floodgate to many researchers daring to talk about Caesarean movement. The greatest pain was the only mortality. The loss of a dear friend through poor, poor post-operative care. In my reflection during the darkest of my days, especially following my suspension, the encouraging words of my great teacher, Dr. Sonny Ukudi of Zuma Hospital Bene, I won't be forgotten. You see, when all hope seems lost, a few encouraging words from your mentor will lift you up. I experience it, and to Dr. Sonny Ukudi, I say I am very grateful for your encouraging words. We are proud to have been in the core of obstetric surgeons who champion and successfully change or brought about a change in the world's attitude to a surgical procedure that is quite beneficial to the client and that has the name for a caesarean delivery at the same time and at the same time the power of the, of the uterus. We have gone through these recommendations before that you must do your space selection, plurality of cavity of the uterus. You must select the best suture and you must, most important, oxytocin infusion must be in place for 12 to 24 hours. And for that research, probably should be carried out, comparing that from caesarean section and caesarean movement. As clinicians, researchers, and teachers, we must embrace change. Because in embracing change, you become adaptable, you become more capable of handling whatever life throws at you. It allows you to gain an education and continuously improve it throughout your life. For an academic, proactive attitude, change makes opportunity. It opens the doors. I'm grateful to God, the giver of life, for keeping me to now to make this rather belated inaugural lecture. I should have done inaugural lecture. <laughs> But at least I'm still grateful to God that I have done it so today. It's better late. <laughs> I thank Madam Vice Chancellor, Professor Mrs. Lillian Moti, and her Excellency for the opportunity to make this presentation. And former Vice Chancellor, Professor O. Ushodi. She was my very good friend. For blessed memory, in whose tenure as Missy, I was announced a professor. and the Dean of Medicine, Professor W. Sajjo. I want to thank my chief medical director, Professor Dalit Nobasaki and his management team, who has not only given me various committees to head, but also to 
my children. <laughs> To my fellow researchers, Pauliambis researchers, especially Dr. Ojobo and Dr. Obama is in Britain and Professor Ande, my colleagues and mentees present and those who don't make it here today, all residents and students, I thank you. I also acknowledge my associate department, community medicine and ICT in UBTH. I thank all my professional group, my club members, especially the do club and the professional club. Of course, Immaculate Conception College of Boys and Girls. And you people know that December 8th is the feast of Immaculate Conception. And December 8th is the day of the German I am very grateful. Of course, the most important set I must uh, recommend are uh, sitting here in front. They are my class of FY70, the Pioneer Students of Unity. The people who took my study in 1970. I thank my family, extended and nuclear. They are all sitting here, especially my wife, the beautiful Mrs. Oli. Uh, I'm going to our 46-year-old oh. And God has been good. Yes. Finally, I thank you Thank you very much.